Hey y'all, welcome to Miss Clark's chemistry class. In this lesson, we're gonna learn all about the history of the atom. All of the sciences that contributed to what we consider now to be the modern model of the atom. We all of a sudden dissed it and say, hey, there's an atom and it's got protons, neutrons, and electrons. It was definitely a journey through time, so let's go through that journey together. So let's start our journey with Democritus. Now Democritus, this is a Greek philosopher you see that on the timeline, 460 B.C. Now, Democritus, he noticed that when you take rock and you're chiseling it down to create some kind of something, that it just keeps getting smaller and smaller. And he proposed if you keep splitting this rock in half, and then you take that half and you split that in half, and then you take that half and you split that in half, and you keep going, there's going to be this basic building block at the very end. You're not just going to run out of matter to keep splitting in half. There's always going to be some basic building block to matter. He said that whatever this basic building block, that it is uncuttable. So he's saying that whatever this bit of matter is, when you get so far down to the basic building block, that basic building block, you can't cut any further. The Greek word for that was atomos. So we give Democritus credit for discovering the very first meaning of the atom. Unfortunately, during Democritus's time, this is when Aristotle, all these other big time names were real popular, and they completely disagreed with Democritus. So unfortunately, even though Democritus was on the right track with an atom being the basic building block and that it was uncuttable, not only that, he even said the atom had a lot of empty space in it. And he's doing this without any lab equipment. He's not doing any experimentation. He is just noticing his observations. And like I said, Aristotle and the other group did not go along with what he had to say. And so Democritus was ostracized for his ideas and was not given credit for at least 2,000 years after he first said what he thought an atom was. Okay, so if we travel about 2,000 years into the future, we get to the year 1803. And I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't really care about these years so much. I just like to put them on a timeline so you can kind of see how we progressed with developing the modern model of the atom. So John Dalton, he's the next scientist that makes it onto our timeline. Now, John Dalton, he was a physicist, a chemist, a mathematician, and he was doing experiments. He was very interested in the weights of different gases. And he also gets credit for a lot of other chemical discoveries. But right now, we're going to stick with just the atom. Now, John Dalton, after doing some of his experiments, he came up with a five postulate theory. You need to make sure and know these. So the first postulate of his theory says, all matter is made up of atoms. Now, some of these postulates to us nowadays, we're gonna be like, duh, of course it is. But back in John Dalton's time, this was a brand new idea. So all matter is made up of atoms. Not only is all matter made up of these things called atoms, atoms themselves are indivisible and indestructible. That means we can't cut them in half and make them smaller. Democritus said that. But he's also saying they're indestructible. Now, this is one of the postulates that we have proven to be not true because we have learned that we can divide an atom and we can destroy it. This is where we get nuclear fission, which is a topic on a later video. And we also know that atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The third postulate to his theory states that all atoms in an element are identical in mass and properties. So if I scooped up a bucket of gold, according to John Dalton, every single gold atom has the same mass and the same properties. This is another one that we have proven not true. Isotopes. Isotopes are two atoms of the same identity, but they have a different mass because of the number of neutrons. This third postulate of Dalton's atomic theory, we have now proven to be not true. The fourth postulate says that atoms cannot be created nor destroyed. We can only rearrange atoms. If we want to have one compound and make a new compound, Atoms are going to chemically have to rearrange, but we're not creating atoms out of the blue, and we're not destroying atoms. 
even when we talked about nuclear fission, when I said atoms can't be destroyed, the mass is being converted into energy, so there was no loss. And then the last postulate says that atoms combined in whole number ratios. This is when we're forming compounds. Compounds are made of atoms, and they're bonded together in whole number ratios. When we have water, H2O, we have two hydrogen atoms and we have one oxygen atom. We can't have like one and a half hydrogen atoms and one half oxygen atoms. They have to form compounds with whole number ratios. Now Dalton thought that atoms were just this solid sphere of matter that could not be destroyed, could not be broken down. He did not know any of the parts of the atom. So we call Dalton's model of the atom the billiard ball model because it looks like a pool ball. You know, billiards, pool, we're playing pool, shooting pool. You remember what I'm talking about, billiards? So he says it looks like a billiard ball, just a solid mass of matter that can't be broken down any farther. Now I'm gonna take a tiny detour away from the atomic model and talk about Dmitry Mendeleev. He fits in our timeline right here at 1869. Again, I don't really care about the dates, I just want you to see the progression. Now Dmitry Mendeleev here, he is the first person who put together the elements on the periodic table and realized that when the elements are placed in a certain order, that different properties arise. We give Dmitry Mendeleev the title of the father of the periodic table. Again, not necessarily because he was the first person to put elements and call it a periodic table. He's the first person that realized there is a pattern when the elements are placed on the periodic table in a certain order, a pattern arises. In fact, Dmitry Mendeleev was so sure of this pattern that he would leave gaps in the periodic table that he created, gaps because those elements had not been discovered yet. And then several years down the line, of course, those elements were discovered, and lo and behold, they fit right in the periodic table, right where Dmitry had left those holes. So I wanted to give Credit to him real quick because that's where we are in the timeline. Dmitry Mendeleev, father of the periodic table. Now this is not what the modern periodic table looks like, but he gets credit for being the first. Now we travel on down to 1897 and we meet J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson gets credit for discovering the electron. So this is the first time that someone has suggested that the atom is actually made up of these subatomic particles. The first one discovered, the tiniest one, the one with the least amount of mass, the electron. Let's talk about how JJ found this electron. Now he used this experiment and he called it the cathode ray tube. That's because he used this device right here and this device is called a cathode ray tube. You would find cathode ray tubes in old monitors, those old TVs, you know the old big bulky TVs that have the big backs on them, not the flat screen. Anyway, the cathode ray tube shoots these beams of light and that's what causes the color and the images to come up on monitors and screens. Now this is an old school cathode ray tube because you know, J.J. Thompson, he's pretty old school. And what happened was, is he noticed, let me get some rays here. He noticed that when he shot this ray, now this was just high energy pulses. So he shot this ray and it lit up this screen right here. He ran this magnet and he would cause these metal plates to become charged. Well, he realized that when he put this magnet up close to this plate, that this beam would actually veer away from the magnet. That was really confusing to him. So he would move the magnet to the other side. And when he ran this magnet over by this plate, he noticed that the beam, again, would veer away from it. Well, he knew that this beam, he knew that this magnet had a negative charge. And he also knew that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So if this magnet is causing this beam to push away, then this beam of energy, this beam of light must also be negative. And remember the charges of electrons, they are negative. So of course he had a lot more work to do in this experiment. He had to figure out masses. He also is the one who gets credit for massing the electron by using this cathode ray tube. Now this is just the very beginnings, the very basic of his experiment, but that's what got him down the path to discover the electron. So now we have a part, the electron. Now J.J. Thompson, he thought the atom was this big sphere, and he said that this sphere, 
was positively charged. But then he said there is also these little, he called them carpuscles. We call them electrons. And he said that they are scattered all throughout the sphere of positiveness. And he said that the atom kind of reminded him of his favorite dessert, plum pudding. Now, plum pudding is like a bready pudding, and it's got bits of raisins throughout. He said that the bready pudding part was like this positive area, this positive solid mass of the atom, and that the raisins scattered throughout were like these electrons. So J.J. Thompson's model is called the plum pudding model. Not very chemical sounding, is it? Okay, so if we move on down the timeline, we get to 1911. 1911, Ernest Rutherford. Now, Ernest Rutherford, he gets credit for discovering the nucleus. He discovered that the nucleus was positive, and since we know that the nucleus is positive because of those protons, we also give him credit for the proton. Let's look at how Ernest Rutherford figured out that there is not only a nucleus, but that it's positive. Ernest Rutherford used this experiment called the gold foil experiment. First, we have this little box right here. Now this box, it's going to shoot out alpha particles. Now an alpha particle is made out of two protons and two neutrons. And since if we look at the periodic table at number two, that's helium, we call an alpha particle a helium nucleus. I have all of that on another video with another unit. We'll view that at a different time. But right now, we just need to know that these alpha particles are being shot out of this machine right towards a piece of gold foil. Now let me let you think about a gold foil. Think of aluminum foil, just like that, but it's made out of gold atoms and not aluminum atoms. This alpha particle should hit this atom and something should happen or this alpha particle is going to just go straight through, and that is exactly what happened. When he shot these alpha particles, so much of these alpha particles just went straight through the gold foil. But every once in a while, one of these alpha particles hit something and then ricocheted. Or it would hit something and not only ricochet, but come right back at him. And so every once in a while, you were having these alpha particles that were just ricocheting off. Things he noticed about this ricocheting particle. They must be hitting something. This something must be big. And this something must be positive. Because a helium nucleus is positive, we're seeing that when these particles hit this something, whatever something is, they're repelled, they're shot away. And if these alpha particles are positive, and whatever they're hitting in the gold foil, is causing them to repel, whatever they're hitting must also be positive. So he decided that these gold atoms must have a dense nucleus in the center. So if we have a dense positive nucleus, and then basically he's saying that the atom is just a lot of empty space. Yeah, we've got these negatives, but the negatives reside in this empty space. The nucleus is this big, dense center that's positive, and then the rest of the atom is empty space. And he realized that the atom was mostly empty space because of all these alpha particles that just went straight through. So if we're gonna look at this on a different scale, let's say, let's say we've got this gold foil. Let's blow it up a little bit. So here's our gold foil, and we've got gold atoms. Let me make the gold atoms gold. But remember, we've got all this empty space. That's where the electrons are. So basically, he's saying that when he shoots these particles, some of the particles just go straight through. But every once in a while, a particle hits a nucleus, shoots out the other way. So Rutherford gets credit for saying that there's a positive nucleus and that the atom is mostly empty space. We call his model the nuclear model because this is the first scientist that said atoms have nuclei. And here we can just use this as the picture of the model. A positive, dense nucleus with the negatives floating around in the empty space. So let's keep traveling. We're not going too much into the future. We're just going to 1913, and we're meeting Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr was actually a physicist. He didn't even do many experiments to add to his contribution of the atomic model. He did a lot of math, and we give 
Niels Bohr credit. Bohr, are you recognizing that name, a Bohr model? The Bohr model of an atom, which is the way we draw atoms, we do give credit to Niels Bohr for this. We say that Niel discovered the energy levels. Before now, we said the electrons were just hanging out in the empty space. Niels Bohr, he applied a mathematical equation and he discovered that actually electrons are traveling in energy levels around the nucleus. The electrons traveling in energy levels close to the nucleus have less energy and the electrons that go to the outermost energy levels have the most energy. So as the electrons are farther away from the nucleus, they contain more energy. Now, I most of the time call this just a Bohr's model, but Niels Bohr, you know, he didn't name it after himself, he called it the planetary model. And I think we can see why. The nucleus is the center of the atom, like the sun, and the electrons are orbiting in their energy levels at different energy levels around the nucleus, where the first energy level has the least amount of energy all the way out to the outermost energy level, which has the most energy. Now, when we draw models, we still draw Bohr models. We draw them using the planetary model because it's easier to see. Now, really and truly, electrons are constantly moving very, very quickly. They're changing positions very, very quickly, and they're really not orbiting the nucleus around these energy levels. We now know there's a more accurate picture of a model than a Bohr model. Let's talk about those two scientists. Now, we have two scientists here getting credit for the most modern model of the atom. We've got Erwin Schrodinger. You may have heard of Erwin Schrodinger before. Sheldon loves to talk, to talk about him in the Big Bang Theory. You might have heard about Schrodinger's equation, Schrodinger's cat. You know, if you put a cat in the box, you don't really know if he's alive or dead. So, like, there's this moment in time where he's both. The dual relationship of something, that led to this whole atomic theory. He's saying electrons, they can act like energy, they can act like matter, they have this dual property to them. We're gonna come back to that in a future video, so make sure you're paying attention. We're gonna talk about just the electron in a lot of detail, and we're gonna come back to Schrodinger and this Werner Heisenberg. Here's another name that might seem familiar to you just because of pop culture, Werner Heisenberg. That's right, Heisenberg for Breaking Bad, that's a real person. Not only is he a real person, his contribution to chemistry was great. That's why Walter used his name. So Schrodinger and Heisenberg, both are physicists and mathematicians, and they applied many, many math equations all to the atomic structure. And what they realized was that dual property of the electron, like I was saying. Electrons are made of energy, and they're made of matter. And how can they be both at the same time? And they must act very, very strangely because they can behave like both things at the same time. And so we get Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. This is his big claim to fame. He says the position and velocity of an object cannot be measured at the same time. So this object we're talking about, the electron, it's moving so fast that there is no way to figure out its speed and where it is at the same time. We can know how fast it's going, or we can know where it's located, but we can't know both at the same time. This uncertainty principle gave rise to the most modern model of the atom, and we call that the quantum mechanical model. We're gonna learn all about that in a lot of detail in an upcoming lesson, so I'm not going to go into the detail now, but basically this model talks about the electron behaving like a wave. Another very common title for this might be called the wave model. I've heard it both ways. I call it the quantum mechanical model because that's what I was taught. Where we're gonna learn about electrons not being in energy levels, they're really in these things called orbitals and they're sublevels. We're gonna learn that the energy level is just much more complicated than an orbit around the nucleus. So make sure and stay tuned to that lesson. Okay, well, that's all I have on the history of the atom. Now, did I cover every single scientist that contributed to the modern model of how we view an atom? Of course not. These are the ones that get the biggest accolades. It's the one I talk about in my class most often. But of course, there's other scientists that contributed along the way. I hope this helped. Until next time, bye, y'all.